Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining Foundry Live. My name is Elise, and I am part of the industry marketing team at Foundry, and I'm excited to have with me Jen Goldfinch, Matt Mather Bazarol, Dan Ring, and Juan Salazar to prevent to present to present the Education Summit, solving tomorrow's challenges today. Before we get started, I would like to give you a quick Foundry update and go over some housekeeping. First of all, today's session is being recorded and a link of the recording will be sent directly to you when the webinar is over. Also, here is our agenda for today. Right now we're going through the intro, but up next we'll have an update with our education program. We'll also review the sessions that have been included in Foundry Live over the past two weeks and go over the key topics for education, including color management, machine learning, and virtual production. If you have any questions for our presenters today, please feel free to add them into the questions tab on the right-hand side. Also, I'd like to give a special thank you to our sponsors, Lenovo and AMD. We are working with Lenovo, AMD, and our other partners as part of a new program to test selected workstations across all of our products. Thanks to our sponsors, we're excited to be giving away a ThinkStation P620, a Lenovo and AMD Threadripper system, which includes an NVIDIA Quadro RTX 5000, to one lucky attendee. We started Foundry Live last summer as a way to connect with you virtually and share our product updates. And this year we're excited to be back for part two. Today we're wrapping Foundry Live, but over the past two weeks, we've hosted some great sessions where we reviewed the roadmap for Mari and Katana. We also took a look at the recent Nuke 13 and Moto 15 releases. And we heard from Dan and Matt in a innovation and research session. If you want to watch any of the recordings, they are available on our live stream page. And also this year, Foundry is taking part in several um, third-party virtual events. And up next, we'll be at NVIDIA's GTC. We'll also be at FMX, the real-time conference, and SIGGRAPH. So please be on the lookout for us. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention that Foundry is actively involved in the Academy Software Foundation as we use many of their open source projects that are widely used in production. We have representation on the board, the outreach committee, and are actively involved in the technical advisory council and various working groups. To be successful, the Academy Software Foundation needs community members like you to contribute code, get involved, and help spread the word about the foundation. Visit their website, www.aswf.io, for more information on how to get involved. Also, I'd like to encourage you to follow Foundry on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channels, and check out the Foundry's Insight Hub. Also, we are launching a new private LinkedIn group for educators, trainers, and instructors, which Jen will share more about. And finally, as part of today's session, we are going to be giving away the new Code X book, Nodes Within Nodes, written by Daniel Smith, VFX supervisor and mentor. The book is a digital e-copy, and we will we'll be emailing the winners after today's session. So please keep an eye out on your email. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for joining. I hope that you enjoy today's session and here's Jen. Thank you, Elise. And thank you everyone from joining, for joining us from all over the world. Um, we're really excited to be here today. This presentation is our second education summit, our second virtual education summit, um, and is targeted towards educators, trainers, instructors, department chairs, um, department administrators, anyone who's involved in the teaching of Foundry products. If you're here as a student, you're welcome to stay. There's lots of information on learning uh, paths and programs for you. Um, so hello and welcome. We really appreciate your time. We know it's a busy time of year and we're very grateful that you're spending it with us this afternoon, evening or morning. My name is Jen Goldfinch and I'm the Director of Industry Marketing at Foundry, which also includes responsibility for education outreach. Our goal of this session is to share with you, our network of educators, some of the latest products and releases from Foundry, but looking at these with an education lens. We'll recap some of our recent product launches and also share with you some of the things we're doing in Nuke, which we think is going to be so exciting for education. To start, I'd like to introduce you to our team. Um, we have two education managers who take care of sales and licensing. We have Kaylin, who's based in Austin, Texas, and Eugenie, who's based in London, England. Um, together, they manage our education accounts from around the world, and they work closely with Harold Carter, also known as Trey, 
who may or may not have sent you um, education licenses over the last year. Trey's been a great addition to our team. He's been really dedicated to helping schools stay up and running, especially during um, some of those shutdowns last year. On the marketing and outreach side, my colleague Elise, who you just met, and I work closely with the team to, for opportunities on education events, sharing um, information with educators, and just expanding our programs overall. In the last several years, Foundry has been investing quite heavily in what we call our Foundry Learn platform. Headed up by Ian Taylor and his team in London, this group works with internal and external content creators and trainers to, de to develop learning materials and pathways for Foundry software. Last year alone, the team delivered over 460 videos um, to help artists how to use our products, learn our products, and use them in production. There's a treasure trove of content there, freely available for you to share with your students and colleagues. So just for a minute, let's talk about last year. This is how I consider March 2020 when I see the picture. Um, we were all thrown a curveball that none of us have expect, expected to say the very least. But with disruption comes change, and as a result from last year's global work from home situation, we took a closer look at the way we offer our student licenses to schools and tried to simplify the process for our customers. Before the pandemic, we sold education licenses to schools for lab work and VPN access for students. We offered first year free licenses to individual students who wanted to learn our different software packages. When we moved to work from home model during the global lockdowns, many students had already downloaded the first year free or downloaded it right at the beginning um, to work from home. And then we also had to work with schools to offer temporary licenses for students forced out of their normal classroom environment. It wasn't a permanent solution, it was more of a patchwork solution. So we've changed things. In January of this year, we updated our model from first year free to free home use keys for all of our education customers. If you're currently a school that teaches Foundry software, you should have received an email from us with details on how to obtain your home use license keys for your students. This key is valid for the same duration as your school's institutional licenses to support your students through their courses. New annual at-home keys will be issued to, with your institutional license renewal each year. The home use keys allow your students to quickly and easily install Nuke, Mari, Katana, or Moto on their personal computers without needing to apply or undergo any verification process. They are not a replacement to your classroom licenses and can't be installed on a classroom or lab computer. Any students that are studying at schools that do not treat Foundry's products can apply for an individual free license. All of our applications are reviewed for, by the education team. Our overall goals are to make sure that our education customers are very well supported and also to encourage students to explore our software. If you think that your school should have keys for your students but you haven't received anything, please contact education at foundry.com as soon as possible. So, as Elise mentioned, um, this is our fifth session of Foundry Live, which was basically two weeks of product events. We had product launches. We had a future look, at, future look of our look development and lighting tools. We did a deep dive into what's going on in our research team and innovation projects, as well as launching Moto 15 and Nuke 13. All of these presentations are available on demand for you to watch, but I'll try and quickly summarize for you. One of our fastest growing products in the educational space is Katana, our look development and lighting tool. Alongside Mari, our 3D texture painting tool, these products make up our look dev and lighting workflow and are used by some of the biggest VFX studios around the world. Late last year, we launched Katana 4.0 with new lighting tools, foresight rendering, and much more. Katana 4 was quickly embraced by our clients and became the cornerstone of our look dev and lighting strategy for 2021. We thank our schools who have been teaching Katana. And in fact, in the last year, over 10 schools added Katana to their educational curriculum, which makes our commercial clients happy because Katana lighters are in super high demand. More and more schools are adding Katana to their programs alongside Mari and Nuke. So if you're interested in knowing more, please raise your hand. We'll be happy to tell you. Interoperability between Katana and Mari is a big part of Katana's future development plans to streamline look dev and lighting workflows. 
At our Foundry Live session last week, hosted by our Look Dev and Lighting teams, we previewed the work the team is doing on further development to our tools, including the long-term vision of easing pipeline friction and improving interop between our products. That includes between Katana and Mari and Katana and Nuke. If you're interested in learning more about implementing Katana in your school, please let us know in the poll. This is a really exciting time for schools to add these products to your curriculum. And the good news is your education collectives already include Mari and Katana alongside Nuke and of course Moto, our 3D modeling package. Speaking of Moto, Moto continues to shine in the design market, especially with the recent release of Moto 15. Major brands like Nike, New Balance, Keen Tools, sorry, Keen Shoes, <laughs> and many, many others depend on Moto's powerful and flexible tool set to empower artists to explore and develop ideas without jumping through technical hoops. If your school has product design courses, Moto is a fantastic software that is used by some of the biggest companies in the world for packaging and product design. Please reach out to education at foundry.com for more information. For those of you who are teaching Nuke, Foundry's award-winning compositing tool, you'll definitely want to check out what's new with Nuke 13. Launched just over a week ago, Nuke 13 offers a new machine learning framework, which my colleague Dan is going to talk a little bit more about. Also, implementation of a hydro-powered 3D viewport and extended sync review. Our mission is to continue to empower artists to get them to the final pixel-perfect image quicker than ever before. If you want to watch the replay of the Nuke 13 launch, we've included a link to the webinar in the chat. One update we did want to call out to you specifically is Nuke's migration to the VFX Reference Platform 2020. The VFX Reference Platform is a set of tool and library versions to be used as a common target platform for building software for the VFX industry. The Reference Platform is updated by a group of software vendors in collaboration with the Visual Effects Society Technology Committee. With that includes my migrating Nuke 13 to Python 3. We have seen customers sharing tips on how to convert scripts in a variety of public forms, and we have written a support article on the topic. If you are a Foundry customer, and if you are having issues with this, you can always reach out to support at foundry.com. With that, I would like to introduce you to my colleague, Juan Salazar, Senior Product Manager at Foundry, who is going to talk to you a little bit about a very exciting topic that's hot on our minds. Juan? The thank you, Jen. Well, thank you, Jen. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so, color management. So, um, we really wanted to take this opportunity today to talk to you about color management um, and some of the work that we've been doing during the last year, um, not just on the topic, but also to help you teach uh, color management. So, the first thing kind of Obviously, we are a, uh, a visual industry, and color management is at the forefront of everything that we do. One of the main things with this is Nuke has always been part of that, and obviously part of linear color workflows since the beginning, and the management of complex image processing. So over the years, we have been really looking into how this progresses and moves in the industry. Uh, from joining the ASUS uh, logo group or, or partner group back in 2016. Um, and we have been working ever since on that, not only on ASUS, but obviously on how all the companies were doing this. And especially since we are part of the OCIO and we have OCIO in Nuke, uh, we are part of this Academy Software Foundation. And obviously we are helping guide how OCIO gets developed which is a very exciting part of what is happening this year on color management. So one of the main things with this is Nuke has always been the reference uh, for color. So it doesn't matter which part of the pipeline you are, you normally use Nuke to check the color of whatever you're actually working on. And with that, obviously, comes OCIO in the works. Um, I just realized I didn't click here. There you go. Um, so one of the main things with that is that this year the OCIO group released OCIO version 2. For those of you that don't know much about OCIO version 2, I'm going to give you a couple of highlights of it. 
So the first one, and probably the most important one, is the CPU and GPU consistency. This brings two main things into it. One is obviously in Nuke, if you have the GPU viewer uh, option, now that acceleration is faster and is consistent with what you're seeing on the CPU. And for those of you that use Nuke Studio and Hero, now you have a consistency on the viewer between the Nuke Studio and Hero viewer and the Node Graph viewer as well, um, either on CPU and on GPU. The other big part of the OCIO V2 is the built-in color transforms. This reduces uh, the dependencies on external lot files and the quality of the lot files. So this will actually give us an, a, a much better way of working in color. Plus, obviously, it has a native support for ACES. So we have been integrating OCIO V2 um, in for the last few months we've been working again with the OCIO guys quite hard on this and we are going to have an alpha of 13.1 so we released 13 last this week and now we're already on alphas for 13.1 uh, with really interesting stuff that we've been working on and we'll be releasing this very very soon um, with the OCIO integration already um, ready for you to test if you are not part of the testing group, please get in contact with us. Um, there is a forum, and you can be part of the testing group. But that is not all that is happening in call management. Um, with Netflix and other streamers looking into full HDR workflows, this has bring a lot of challenges into the industries, into different companies, and even the artists to understand what and what are the gotchas. Even though new can have have been always been able to actually deal with it. Uh, how you look at it is, is an issue, or how you understand what is happening. So to that means, we partner from last year, um, and it's probably a little bit over a year that we've been working on this, um, and we partnered with Netflix to see how we could help to educate the industry and the different customers um, that are delivering this type of work for them. And we partnered with Victor Perez as well, to create these fundamentals on ACES workflows in Nuke. The first course will be out on, um, on YouTube channels and on Foundry Learn. And we'll be doing a webinar next week on Wednesday the 31st uh, with Victor and with Carl Payne, who is the image specialist at Netflix, who has helped us all through these workflows. There will be more content coming. And this is for you to use and teach with your students, share with your students, it will be online, everything um, ready for you guys to use. And again, we are taking from the basics all the way through. So the, this first part is the basics and the understanding. This will help on processes, not only for Nuke, but in Katana, in Mari, in any part of the pipeline. Um, and then we're actually, the next few chapters will be more in depth on how you do certain things inside Nuke directly. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you very much to all of you that teach Nuke uh, and bring in the new generations of Nuke artists into the industry. Um, I used to be a teacher, and I know how hard it is. So thank you very much for that work. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it now to Dan, uh, to Dan Ring, our head of research, uh, who's going to talk to you about Copycat, uh, which is our machine learning framework that is now available in Nuke 13. So Dan, all over to you. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Juan. And hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, delighted to be talking about um, a topic that has been very close to our hearts for the last while, and that is machine learning. So in particular, machine learning for VFX. So machine learning is a hot topic, but obviously we're in VFX and animation and post-production industries. And that's obviously going to have a huge impact on how we work and what we do and our, our productivity and the kind of the quality of the results that we can expect. And we're already starting to see some really, really nice examples coming out. In particular, super resolution, uh, deep fakes is obviously a really good one. And also things like matting and masking and uh, kind of using machine learning to solve kind of quite time consuming tasks. So we're already starting to see the, the beginnings of, of um, these sort of like the potential of um, machine learning. And today I, I want to I want to present um, a tool that we're, has, has, we, we sort of unveiled last week as part of the, the Nuke 13 launch, and that is Copycat. 
So if you haven't seen Copycat before, Copycat is essentially a machine learning tool that allows you to train a neural network to create your own sequence specific effect. So I'll, sh I'll show you what that means in a second. But essentially, we're not trying to solve the world. We're just trying to solve it for this one shot or this one problem that we have. And that's the kind of the crux of the power of machine learning here. Essentially, an artist gives the tool a small set of before and after example images. So you know what the, the images that you have, and then examples of the images that you want. And then Copycat learns to replicate that transform from what you have to what you want across the rest of that sequence, so all of the other frames. Crucially, Copycat puts AI into the hands of the artist's imagination, and that's really what we're trying to get across here. So, Elise, would you mind playing the video? I'm going to show you an example of Copycat and how it works. So here's Copycat in Nuke 13. The idea, you take your input sequence, and here we're going to try and roto this guy or mask this guy out of the background. Now we do this by just rotoing six frames here, so just six keyframes out of that whole sequence. And we do, in here, we're just going to do them kind of loose, and then we feed them into Copycat, and we click this Start Training button. And what you can see here in that small little um, contact sheet there is an example of Copycat trying to figure out how it takes this input image and generates the mat. Now, this does take a while, so it's good if you go have lunch. So in this case, this, this um, result was about an hour or so. But once you've, you're finished having your dessert and maybe uh, an espresso or two, then when you come back, you should have a nice mask. And you can see that the, the mask, this, this is a, a sequence that's several hundred frames, and we were able to get this sequence, this mask here, uh, from just those six keyframes and waiting over lunch. And the cool thing about this is, oh, um, is that, maybe I'm going to try and pause that for a sec. The cool thing about this is that with that sequence, it was, um, and this, this, was, this is a key thing that I'm going to stress for educators and why um, one of the things that popped up out of the other sessions, why machine learning isn't going to take any artist jobs is that the quality of the output is directly dependent on the quality of the input. You still need to be a good artist in order to use this. Like this won't help you be, this won't make a, a bad artist better. It'll just make you be a bad artist faster. So that's the key thing to remember here. Now I do want to show you another a few examples here. Here's one of digital beauty work. And I'm showing you here, this is um, where we have our own Henry Cavill here, uh, Luca Prestini, so one of the, 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 the air research team. And here we painted out, I think it's either six or 10 uh, frames for, of, of where we painted out Luca's beard and then gave it to Copycat and it was able to remove his beard for the rest of the sequence. Now this is quite a tough one and actually required longer training, but it, the nice thing here is that it, it captured the variation of light and all the kind of the changes of, of light and, and shade and contrast. Here's another pre-trained tool within uh, Copycat. So within the air tools, I should say, and that is upscale. So this is obviously about up, up resing your footage. And you can see here that the default is just a 2x upsample. And what the idea here is that it tries to recover the detail that's like kind of like inherent or intrinsic or sometimes hidden uh, within inside the image. Another uh, pre-trained tool is deblur. So this one's really nice, and it's about removing the kind of you know, the, the blur, the softness that's included from both motion blur as well as when things are out of focus. Now, this example here is really nice in that it contains a variety of kind of blur amounts. And you can see that in some cases it, it works quite well, it removes a lot of blur. And then in some cases, the effect can be quite soft. So the cool thing about this, though, is that it's not going to, if you have a completely blurry shot, sometimes it'll do something, sometimes it might not do anything. But in most cases, if the blur is very minor, it's, it's going to sharpen the image up quite nicely. And in particular, if you're doing tracking and stabilizing workflows and you have like your stabilized shot and you can see all the kind of the motion blur that's kind of like bowls around it, this will actually, in, in general, depending on the, the, the motion, um, will remove a lot of that blur. So it's a really, really nice tool and we're really happy about it. Um, and particularly like for out of focus shots as well. So again, if, you're, if the, the shot that you have is just like slightly out of, out of focus, this tool can help kind of pull things back in a bit. Another example here is on bruise removal. So again, digital beauty work. And the really nice thing here is, I'm gonna kind of, this is the after. And I think um, I'm pushing this video to, the, to its limits. But you can see here as you go kind of before and after, you can see the effect of the bruise removal. Now, the very nice thing about this is that this after result was found by only supplying two keyframes 
out of this 340 frame sequence and then supplying it to copycat. The really nice thing here is like not only is it only a, like two keyframes that did you need to paint, but the detail of the, the skin is, is retained across the entirety of the sequence. So it's really, really nice. And then lastly here, you can, this is a final of copycat. Yeah, perfect. So the, 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 the last thing point that I wanted to make on copycat was that we're still figuring out and understanding and seeing kind of the results of and examples that people are, are, are playing with this. And really what we're seeing is that like with copycat, it really is fed by your imagination. So the more kind of tasks and things that you can try and think, again, if you've got like any anything, any before examples and after example, or any examples of what you want uh, the image to look like given an input image, try throw it into copycat and see what it does. But we're, we're constantly surprised by the, the kind of variety and the power of the tool. Now, next up then, so if we head back to the slides. Now, if only we had an AI tool that could bring back our slides. They're coming, don't worry. <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm really keen. So, the, the, what, I'm really keen then for to understand what sort of needs that, that educators would need from this. So, one thing I'm going to I'm going to call out here that I that we didn't have didn't put it on a slide, but I'm going to call it out here, is that machine learning obviously requires a new set of kind of knowledge uh, and, to, and kind of understanding about like about the tools about what can what can happen and internally we've been putting together a course on machine learning for vfx taking you from the very beginning up until and um, like very advanced kind of hardcore machine learning stuff but all within the context of visual effects and animation and please let us know in the chat um, or else in the questions and um, if this is something that would be of interest to you and we can kind of start sharing it out as a kind of uh, trial basis um, but essentially it's, it's all examples on how to um yeah what you need to know what concepts you need to know about say training images about models about architecture about gpus um as well as the kind of the the types of things that um, machine learning can be used to, to solve Are we? So Dan, I'm going to share my screen. Are you going to share your screen? Okay, perfect. Share my screen. We'll see how this goes, everyone. Bear with me. <laughs> screen share. All right. Bear with me. I think we got it. How's that? Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Thanks a million, Jen. You have so, to tell me when to go to the next slide, though. <laughs> yes, I will. I will indeed. Um, yeah. So the the next thing that I want to kind of talk about was like, so Copycat is the thing that we're looking at at the moment. It's the thing that's been released in Nuke thirteen zero. We we're interested in looking at what is machine learning about for the future, and like like if we imagine five years from now, what what where does machine learning fit inside of the the, the world of VFX and animation and post production, and the way we look at it is is a kind of a number of, of ways. So in particular, um, if you look at, if you cast your minds back to early VFX software and you think about how, like what made some of that software so powerful, and there's a number of things. Uh, first thing was then C++ SDKs to allow plugin architectures to, uh, to grow and expand. The next thing then was obviously like Python and scripting languages inside of host software. So again, without needing to know all of C++ or have a you know, knowledge of how to com compile plugins, being able to run Python script natively inside the host application to do some task or to integrate n nicely inside a pipeline is extremely powerful and kind of really helps promote the software. But we believe that machine learning is actually the third or the, the latest part of this. So what we've built here is not just with Copycat, it's not just a, a tool that does a thing, but it is, it is a framework for allowing you to build your own tools. And that Copycat lets you do it one way, but we're also looking at how we can embed more and machine learning models into Nuke or allow you to bring your own models to, to, to Nuke and run them natively. 
So imagine like I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that in a, in a couple of years we see things like on Wikipedia where people have compiled and run their own copycat models, their own models from other software. They've, you know, people are comfortable with downloading models from GitHub or training their own models and then bringing the, the, the model themse itself into Nuke and running it natively. So this is, adds another element to the, 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 the education side, I, I should say, where you want to be able to, like, you know, um, you, you know, tell students on how to, you know, that the concepts behind machine learning and, and, and again, how that they can build their own models and uh, integrate them natively. But now, to me, anyway, to the close to my heart, this is about bridging research and production. So this is about getting the kind of the, the ideas of, um, you know, of, of academia and taking them and really embedding them and productizing them into, into Nuke. So um, with that's, that's it on machine learning. I'm very keen to kind of get your thoughts on it in the, the chat or, or for questions later on. Like I said, um, if there's interest in us sharing this sort of mini course that we've been putting together, please let us know. And with that, I'm gonna hand you over to our director of new products, uh, Mr. Matt Maserol. Hi everyone, uh, thanks very much, Dan. Uh, Copycat is really exciting. Um, and another area we're working on in, uh, in our research teams is around real-time workflows. So uh, as Dan discussed, you know, having Copycat uh, be able to uh, empower artists with a lot more, uh, you know, be able to handle a lot more with a lot less work, is really all about scale and efficiencies. Uh, and real time is uh, is about the same thing. Uh, it's really about getting more scale and more efficiencies in terms of uh, production. Um, so we can move to the next slide. So real time is obviously a super hot topic. Uh, we've, we're seeing it in several areas, uh, or like game engines and in renderers and in motion graphics. Um, and uh, you know, at, at Foundry, we've been thinking quite a bit about real time. But our focus is really on uh, how it can optimize uh, the artist's workflows. So um, we'll show an example of this. Uh, if you move to the next slide, um, here's you know kind of a, a kind of a simple pipeline, and uh, you know essentially from lighting to comp. Now imagine you're a lighter and you're starting way off on the left. You know in this traditional model. Um, the way you work is you make changes until you're ready, and uh, you might iterate several times, and then you'll push everything over to the next, uh, over into the next department. Um, so essentially, you move everything into the comp department in this case, and the comp department, you know, might uh, might be satisfied with the work, which is great, or there might you know need to be changes, in which case things get kicked back to uh, to the lighting department. And eventually, after these long iteration loops, uh, results get turned over to the client. And uh, you know, sometimes there is uh, even more changes uh, you know, that are requested, and the loop starts all over again. So the goal is obviously to improve the efficiency of this pipeline. And uh, we see kind of three ways to do this. The first way is to improve iteration around one shot, which is uh, the orange loop. And the second way is to improve iteration between departments, uh, which is the red loop. And finally, you can improve iteration by increasing your throughput, uh, for example, by working across multiple shots, uh, which is the blue loop. Uh, so really, uh, you know, this is all about increasing your scale and your efficiency. Um, so uh, if you move to the next slide, this is an example of uh, a pipeline that's structured more around real-time workflows. The biggest difference between this pipeline and the previous linear one is that all of the data is shared and available to everyone. So you can see that kind of in the pink box at the top. And uh, this allows uh, all departments to work on everything kind of in a live way. And the second big difference is that stakeholders all have input into the work um, and they can all uh, iterate and improve on things uh, you know, together. Uh, so that means that an artist in one department is aware of everything that's going on in the other departments. And that's really important because what it means is that everyone is ultimately working in the context of the final image. So let's take an example. Uh, a lighter might be able to uh, you know, see a slap comp from the comp department, but then make informed decisions about how their work needs to be done. 
And that work can happen in the context of the slap comp until everything starts improving to the, the next level of, of finesse. And this really helps all stakeholders get on the same page and see how the final product is coming together much more quickly. So what kinds of things are required to build a pipeline like this? So uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, so there are three things that we think are really important to building a real-time pipeline. So uh, obviously, uh, you know, real-time technologies, uh, real-time rendering that lets you see, uh, that lets you generate imagery much more quickly. Um, this is, you know, what folks commonly think of when uh, talking about real-time, they're thinking about real-time rendering uh, and real-time image generation. But uh, also, and very importantly, you need all of your tools in your pipeline to work well together and be exchanging data as efficiently as possible, and ideally in real time. And what this is all allows is it allows artists working in different departments to work much more closely and feed off of one another. And finally, you need a strong foundation around open standards. You need your data to be manageable, and you, this is really the key to unlocking collaboration uh, across uh, across a wide scale. And you know some of the key technologies out there that are really important to this are you know USD, Open Timeline IO, and Hydra. And these are really the building blocks for uh, real time pipelines. So this sets the scene um, for everything you know to you need to build a real time pipeline. So you know what are we you know what are we building at Foundry uh, to make all of this a reality? So one project we're working on is Genio. Uh, so Genio is a bridge between Nuke and Unreal Engine. And it's a project that we've, uh, we're developing right now in a closed uh, alpha testing stage. I'll tell you a little bit later how you can, uh, you can get access to it. Um, but before uh, I give you a, a sneak peek, um, you know, let's just say this is uh, something we're really interested in in terms of the long term of where we're going with real-time pipelines. Um, so, uh, you, know, uh, you know, stay tuned for more things uh, coming from us in the future around, around real time. So having said that, let's have a look um, and we can, uh, we can run a little demo of uh, Genio. Now we have to switch back, oh, there we go, excellent. So Genio is a tool that allows you to launch a server within Nuke that connects to Unreal Engine. And once you do that and that connection is established, uh, Genio will populate Nuke with uh, your Unreal sequence. So here we've selected the master sequence, and um, and once that uh, that link is uh, is uh, established, uh, everything is, can be shared live or pretty much close to live between Unreal and Nuke. And that means you can edit your Unreal scene and go back into Nuke and click Update Latest, and then all of the changes in your Unreal scene is brought back into Nuke and up to date. And Genio lets you work on lots of different render passes. So you get your beauty passes, but you also get a lot of utility passes like uh, normals and positions and crypto mat. Um, and you get a lot of fine control over the rendering settings. So you can go into the advanced settings and uh, have a lot of uh, control over Unreal there. But what's really cool is you can create linked cameras. So this is a linked camera that follows the camera that's in Unreal. So it's a live link. And this opens up really interesting workflows uh, that we'll talk about later. And we have Cryptomat support. So we can bring in Cryptomat IDs into Nuke and you can use uh, Nuke's native Cryptomat support to uh, work with uh, individual objects or layers. So uh, this is great for comp work. And now let's look at an example of kind of working across uh, multiple, uh, multiple shots in a sequence. Uh, so in this example, we're creating a volume, a color correction volume around objects uh, and this allows us to make changes to these objects. In this case, we're changing the color on the egg. And this change applies to all of the shots in the sequence. And you can see how that updates in uh, uh, live. So um, that's kind of Genio in a nutshell. And I want to give a huge thank you to Weta and especially uh, the team at Epic for making this awesome scene of the Meerkat available. Uh, so this is available publicly, uh, the, the data set. So a uh, big thank you to them for, for doing that. So um, go back to the slides. It looks like PDF is being challenging, so I'm going to share my screen again. So just bear with me while I get to your slide. 
Great. I'm going to need to find one second. So I'll, I'll set Dan up to uh, talk about uh, another really great uh, area where real time is taking off, uh, which is uh, around, um, which is around uh, virtual production. So uh, Dan, um, why don't you talk to us a little bit about our vision around virtual production? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah, so so this talk on virtual so virtual production is obviously a very hot topic at the moment. Um, meteoric explosion in the number of people who are trying it and the technologies available to use it, and some of the fantastic productions that I've really used in the wild. And um, yeah, the whole the whole space is extremely exciting. The, the really impre impressive thing is around in-camera VFX is obviously this incredible use of the technology to empower filmmakers. And that's essentially what's happening here. Now, uh, unlike many other vir virtual production talks, um, this one is going to be very pictureless because in particular, our, our thinking uh, on this is, uh, again, around how does this affect the roles for VFX and filmmaking? And I think this is probably going to be of interest to the, the audience here in the, in the education area, sector. So roles in VFX and fil filmmaking around in camera VFX and what are the biggest future challenges? Uh, next slide, please, Jen. So the first thing we want to investigate is what do the roles look like today for virtual production shows uh, and what, what do they look like for, for the future and how have they changed? So we were trying to do this kind of uh, in, in a very kind of quantitative way, in a kind of numeric way and gather evidence for it. And it's actually very hard to do that. The best way that we, we kind of found this is by looking at IMDb data. Um, so I'm going to caveat this and say, take this with a, a lot of salt in that this is a very kind of hand wavy kind of uh, comparison. But the, 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 numbers, the numbers are here. So what we've done here is um, we've taken three productions. Um, so all in the kind of like Star Wars kind of uh, world, The Mandalorian, uh, Star Wars Episode Eight, and Star Wars Episode Nine. Um, obviously, the different um, levels of virtual production used from kind of quite a lot to possibly less and even virtually none. So what you're seeing here is the number of VFX cast credits for each of the the product the um, productions broken down by discipline. And you can see here that if we look at the numbers, like while the, the total numbers of, of cast changes with the Mandalorian having quite quite a high number, um, the composition looks roughly the same. But like, let's let's normalize that now and take a closer look. Next slide, please, Jen. There. So we've normalized the, the, the composition now into percentages. And what we can start to see here is that actually the composition looks pretty similar acro across the three productions. So if you look at it just by percentages, you can see that generally not a huge amount has changed in the amount of VFX difference between the productions, except in a couple of cases. So next slide there, please, Jen. The first interesting thing is that in terms of per percentages, comp stays largely the same. So this is interesting in that one of the kind of the selling points of in-camera VFX is that the reduced amount of, of comp or expected re reduction in the amount of comp. But what this is telling us is that there actually isn't a, a change in comp. Now, again, caveat that this doesn't tell us, this is only telling us kind of the number of people who were involved. It doesn't tell us the, the volume of work or how long that they've been involved. But it is interesting that I am kind of from this facet and um, the amount of comp stays around the same. So again, from a production or from an education point of view, this doesn't mean that you would change the, the amount of comp being taught. In, in fact, you need just as much as before. And next slide there, please, Jen. The second area where we see kind of an, an interesting statistic is that roughly 40 you need roughly 40% more crew for asset prep. So for actually making your assets. Now we've all heard the stories of um, of needing to build your assets in advance of the, you know, the, the shoot day. You need to, if you're gonna have a, a set, like a, a prop or a virtual prop, um, it needs to be built in advance. It needs to be you know, final, it needs to go to the wall. And at least it didn't look perfect then. So you're, you're, you're often working in either reduced timescales um, or under kind of like higher, higher pressure. Um, and it, what this is telling us here is actually there's roughly 40% more people working in the, the asset prep and asset creation parts of the pipeline for virtual production or for in-camera VFX virtual production. So this is very interesting because it means then this is it like, again, as for educators, it means then that these, the roles here for asset creation are possibly going to increase if we see a, a kind of a proportional increase of in-camera VFX across the industries. Brilliant. Uh, next slide, please, Jen. 
So here's a slide which is um, again kind of going into more detail on kind of the, the roles and tasks that, that go on for a virtual production shoot and the kind of the actions that, that happen. Um, now I'm, the thing that I'm mainly going to highlight here is that um, is the the variety of roles that happen here on, on set from both kind of pre-production and setup in the blue on the left all the way towards like near real-time production and then shoot the shoot day in red and then delivery and post-production on in yellow and you can see that the, depending on the, the the kind of the things that the tasks that you're doing uh, it actually does require kind of still quite a varied amount of, of roles you can see like the but if we look at the, the change in roles here you can see here compared to say a generalist um, or in um, uh, somebody involved in motion capture you do need a lot more folks are involved in layout and real time. And this is where things are getting interesting is like having this knowledge of, of how do you lay out a virtual production set and how do you actually run the stage and do the various sort of um, kind of on stage or, or uh, in camera VFX kind of specific tasks that may not have existed before, like, um, like um, kind of uh, adjusting the, the, like the offset for the, between the, the, the lens optical center, center and the, um, the, the motion capture crown uh, on, on top of the camera. If you go to the next slide, please. So now if we start looking at like the data and this is where the kind of, we get another kind of uh, story to tell. So if, if we looked at the, the previous uh, slide, it had a, the, the colors of the, the roles and who, were, who was doing them was quite sort of scattered. And what we're seeing here is sort of uh, the, the colors and the amount of data um, sort of kind of becoming a little bit more clear. And what we're seeing here is that um, the kind of where the data is generated and when it's needed. And you can see here that if we look in the prep uh, stages in blue and the, the near real-time stages in green, you can see that this is where the bulk of the, the data that's used on, for the shoot is actually generated. And you can see then the, as we start moving towards the, the, through the production, through the shoot day, you can see that a lot more of the data that's needed for post starts happening and starts being kind of brought further towards the, the right. Now the interesting thing with this is that um, is to kind of basically be, be aware that the like the, the people who are generating the data and where the de the data is going also we also need to kind of pay attention to that and the roles of the people who do that uh, is still not quite clear. So one of the things I wanted to kind of highlight here um, and again um, uh, I'm going to talk about it in, in, a, in, a, in a sec. The things that highlight here is that with the, the changes in role for virtual production is that it's, it still hasn't been a sort of a clear picture on exactly whose job it is to do what. And it can vary like quite significantly between productions, between like either the, 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 the production itself or the, the type of production, whether it's a, a commercial versus um, uh, like a high-end episodic show. So it's one of the things that we're, we're again keenly tracking. I suppose what I'm showing you here is that, that while we can start labeling tasks and roles and, and people, um, it's still quite a hard thing to kind of keep all in, keep like keep all in your head at, at, at one time. I've go to the next slide, Jen, please. And again, just to, to kind of hammer home the um, from if we're if we're if we're in the the post production industry, this slide here is to highlight where the data for post production is generated and where we like how we want to kind of make sure that, that that's kept and going into post. So selfishly, this is where we, we want to spend kind of more of our time in making sure that this data that's generated on set or near set um, is delivered like nicely into post. And it's one of the things that we're going to be keeping, keeping an eye on uh, as we go forwards. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. So to summarize then, and um, we've seen a lot of new challenges with virtual production particularly with asset prep. Obviously, we've seen that there's a, there's a significant rise in the number of people involved in asset prep. We all have heard of the, the pressure on the virtual art department and ensuring that everything is generated and built before shooting. What we're also seeing then is like encoded in that sort of specialty task, uh, specialty colored uh, task slide is the, the challenge around logistics and equipment knowledge, stage setup, testing times, and just the, the kind of the collaboration and the kind of who talks to, to who when. Then it's also compositing. So we, we're seeing that, like, while the the the, the volume of compositing hasn't seen, doesn't seem to have changed, we do know that there are differences in in um, how, what compositing tasks are needed to be done. In particular moiré rig removal, tracking lighthouse removal, um, and also things like color matching between, say, that the color of the practical set and the the the, the wall and the, the kind of the interaction between the two. 
And lastly, then delivery. So how do we actually keep in all, the, all that data and how do we like wrangle that into a place that can be delivered into post? So th some of these have answers now. Some of these are ones that we want to look for the future. And I think as, as educators, it's important to kind of try and keep this, this entire picture in your head as, as much as possible and realize that, that, that you know, the, the kind of the interactions for this, this new world are, are quite complex. Now, uh, I'm going to hand you back over to Matt you know, to wrap up our real-time workflows. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, Dan. Um, that's great. Um, so to wrap up, uh, you know, our belief is that uh, real-time workflows are about a lot more than just real-time rendering. Uh, if you, you know, in order to really uh, truly work in real time, you need to look at the entire pipeline. And as Dan said, you know, this is really important as educators because the, you know, the structure of the pipeline is changing as uh, real-time technologies are adopted and start to change the way people uh, interact in production. So uh, really it's about, you know, more than just generating image in real time, but also about removing friction in the pipeline uh, between departments and building on top of open standards so that everything works really well together. You know, a great example is, you know, the way that virtual production pipelines are emerging, it's really showing the impact that the technology is having. You know, virtual production is a lot, is about a lot more than real-time feedback of LED stage technology and in-camera VFX. Uh, more importantly, uh, it's about how everyone is empowered to collaborate around the potential that's unlocked by that technology. And as Dan said, you know, we're still figuring out uh, how to do that. Uh, but that that's really where the benefits are going to uh, are going to take off. Um, so we think you know in camera VFX is here to stay, but it's also very nascent, and we're super excited about this area, and we're hoping to be able to show uh, a lot more about that uh, in the in the near future. Um, and so finally, you know, real time uh, workflows and just you know the word real time is a kind of a buzzword today. And especially, you know, as it's taken off with virtual production in the last year or so. But, you know, we believe that eventually this is uh, just going to uh, become the norm and uh, the accepted way that we all work. And real-time workflows are just going to become workflows. And this is the, you know, the hope that uh, we want to help, uh, help realize. Uh, and we're really excited about the way the industry is going and uh, really excited about um, building things that uh, help that come, um, uh, come to uh to be in the hands of yourselves and the students uh, that uh, that make up the future of, uh, of production. So with that, uh, I'll hand it back over to Jen and uh, she can close us off. Thank you. Um, thank you for everyone who joined us today. Um, we will have about, we can go a little bit later, about 10 minutes of Q&A after. Um, I just wanna thank my incredible colleagues um, for presenting. They presented last week at all the different events, um, and it's late for Juan and Dan, who are up late from the UK and Ireland, so thank you for being here, both of you. Um, and I wanted to thank Lenovo and AMD for supporting our events. Um, it's just wonderful, and I would love it if the winner was from the Education Summit, but that's just me. Um, so I just wanted to let you guys know, um, there's just so much information out there, and of course, you know, you, you can email us at education at foundry.com for your licensing needs or, or support for your technical questions. But for those of you who are interested in joining us on LinkedIn, um, we've started an education group. I'm new to managing education at Foundry, but I know there's folks on the on the call that remember me from my previous companies when I managed the education programs there. Um, well, hopefully we're expanding our team. We're going to have someone else who will be able to take care of our education programs. But for now, um, we'd love it if you'd join us on the LinkedIn group. Or we posted it in the chat earlier. I'll post it again. Um, this is a great way for us to be able to share some fantastic content. There's so much great stuff out there. Sebastian Shoot is on the call. He's a fantastic compositor from Vancouver. And during the whole lockdown last year, he's been creating amazing videos, including this new one for junior compositors. Um, Hugo Guerra is on the line. He creates tons of learning um, videos for students. He's got great courseware. Love to share his stuff. We'll share Victor Perez's color stuff. So we'd love to use this LinkedIn group to communicate with you. All educators are welcome to join um, to, to build that community together. I also want to do a shout out to the Academy Software Diversity and Inclusion Committee who had these amazing courses um, amazing talks about the 
development side of VFX and how to get into that from a computer science background. So that series of webinars is fantastic. All of these resources we'll be posting to our LinkedIn group. So we would love to have you join us if you can. And with that, I'll stop this weird real-time screen sharing and we'll go right to Q&A. And where am I? Here I am. So I'll get Dan and Juan and Matt. We also have Kaylin uh, backstage if you have any licensing questions, but we'll jump into the questions. Um, I'm going to, oh, okay, and Matt is already answering. Um, I'm going to start this one. Uh, this one looks hard, so I'm just going to, um, I'll give it to Dan. <laughs> cool. Let's go to him. Cost for going for any of this. I just need to write it to put this. Oh. No, I don't so. Um, <laughs> It, it, yeah. it changes the paradigm on, and we've been changing that for a while on the amount of passes that are needed. I think we all have tried to, for a while we were a bit too mad on the passes. I think now it's time that we can reduce that and work in a little bit of a different workflow, uh, but not definitely not set presses. <laughs> not, just, not just that, I think it'll be a lot more. What do you think, Dan? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I suppose it depends. It's like if like you still want access to the passes when you need them. The problem is you don't want to have to render at 100 passes, you, you know, if you only need four of them. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah, like that. I think it's like like the trend towards kind of faster rendering and more in real time, I think, is, is interesting that like you'll be able to, like particularly with Genio, we saw, we saw like, I mean, the Genio tool can spit out like 20 or 30 different passes all like various things that unreal gives you and um, obviously you don't need all of them all the time but the fact that you can you can have access to them immediately is pretty powerful and lets you do very fun things and can get you out of a pinch when you need this all right um we're going to throw another one on stage here um we got that one oh, i'm done answering and I'm gonna another one for Genio here. Oh, it's also from the same the same question. So I'll uh, yeah. is Genio a direct live link to Unreal Engine or is it updated with pre-rendered images out of the engine? Uh, no, direct live link. So when you when you're in Nuke and you request pixels, it's going to pull them live from um, uh, from the engine, and then. Uh, I mean, if you've made changes to the engine, um, or then you can go back into Nuke, and I think as in the video that Matt showed, you can click a, a fetch latest button, and it'll pull in the, the latest changes. Awesome, thank you, Dan. All right. Um, all right. I'm going to give you another another copycat one that you you were typing, but I'm going to put it oh. out there. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. I was actually just typing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so at the moment, it can't, Copycat can't be distributed over multiple nodes. And it's kind of a challenge with machine learning in general that, is that it doesn't really scale nicely across multiple machines. And it just, kind, it just sometimes can scale nicely across multiple GPUs in the same machine. So at the moment, it is, um, it is single machine only. Um, but I mean, we are investigating to see if there are any other ways that we can uh, can use this, um, but yeah, it, it's 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 unlikely for the in the foreseeable future that we'll manage to you'll be able to use your like thousand node uh, render farm to for copy out. Or it's just the beginning, right? <laughs> it is, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're uh, um, we have a question here. I'm going to give this one to Juan, Mister Color Management. Yeah. Yeah, so what was the inbuilt version of ACES on 13.1? So on 13.1, we haven't decided yet. Um, at the moment, it's going to be released with the latest uh, OCIO config uh, for OCIO v2. Um, but that's going to be in the alpha. And then as we get close to that release, we'll define which ACES version will have on that. On 13.0, we released with 1.1 as it is part of the same platform that we had on the BFX reference platform. Cool. All right. Here's another one that we'll um, we're going to need to answer. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> hmm. So yeah, great great question. So at the moment, it does it can use or take advantage of the the Ampere cards. Um, it, the the support is I'm going to ca ca caveat and say it it's they're supported partially in that there is um 
there is a kind of an initial kind of a workaround that you have to apply um, in order to kind of get it to work. Um, but then once it is working, it, it does work and works nicely. Um, we are, just to, to call it out there, um, we are planning on moving to a newer library, like CUDA library, um, which will drop support for Kepler cards. Um, but it does mean actually the Ampere cards, like the RTX uh, 33000 series, um, will run a good bit faster, which is which is great. But already, I mean, we're all, we're already testing on the um, the for 3090s and A6000s, and yeah, they're very nice. Awesome. All right. Um, this is a good question, and Conrad, it is one that's near and dear to our heart about teaching with assets. Um, Juan and I have had hours of conversation about assets. The good news is some of our learning material on Foundry Learn has some available assets. I believe the Austin Myers compositing course yeah. has some, some work. Um, and that's really what the Foundry Learn team is dedicated to doing, is making sure that there is downloadable assets for the, the different courses to follow along. Um, we know it's hard. Uh, Juan, do you have anything to add to that one? No, it's, it's hard. And actually, to any of the companies that are listening to this, if you have assets and you want to share it with the industry, it will be a great thing. Um, again, to help teach and train people is probably the biggest challenge is getting assets. So anyone that wants to be kind and share things with people, please get in contact. <laughs> well, we're, we're always looking. Um, you know, I know some of the courses out there, like Hugo's course comes with some assets. There's different, different, some different instructors will, will have them. Um, we've started working with Action VFX as well, um, a little bit closer to get to, to work on some of the effects and stuff. Um, so we're trying, we hear you, we hear your teacher requests. We will, um, we will do our best. We'll continue to do our best on that one. Um, all right. I'm going to oh, good. Ampere cards. Um, so on the, the what is that workaround? So it's essentially to set an environment variable, relaunch nuke, and then let it wait while it sort of rebuilds the the, the kernels. Um, I think that there's um, a Foundry support. There's a KB, There's a knowledge base article, and it is also on the documentation for nuke thirteen. Um, you can find the information about how to run the environment variable there. And I know there's actually a Foundry Learn video um, that is sitting in my inbox that I'm supposed to review <laughs> on this very topic. So, <laughs> awesome. Oh, right, Jay, can you close that one? I have another question here. I will. Um, sorry. So, a question from Pablo here about events for Spanish speakers. Ah, oh, Pablo. We are absolutely interested in doing more events for Spanish speakers. Uh, we have Juan here who's, who's, who's very passionate about that. Um, we, I saw Richie on the chat um, who's worked with us before. Um, yeah, we actually did one last year with Freddy Chavez um, from Vancouver. We did a how to, how to get into compositing. Um, and I just recently was speaking to another woman um, who's a comp soup who did an interview in Spanish. So we, will, we would like to do more. We're always looking for speakers. So. Um, Pablo, if you're interested, feel free to drop us a note um, either via education at foundry.com. Um, but we would love to have you, uh, we would love to have um, speakers help us because we do believe that the Spanish and Latam um, community is growing and it's very important to us. All right. <laughs> um. There's a few questions on what we're doing for virtual production, so I'm going to throw that for you guys, and you guys can uh, you guys can answer this one. Thanks. Sure. Uh, go, go, go for it, Matt. All right. Uh, so in the virtual production space, so you know we we started looking at uh, the virtual production space really carefully last year. We've been spending a lot of time uh, talking to virtual production practitioners learning a lot about the pipelines and especially the pain points. Um, you know, it's a really fast moving area and we're seeing, um, you know, the, the technology moving really fast, the process is changing really fast. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of LED stages being built, but, you know, there isn't necessarily like a shape of, you know, one singular pipeline for virtual production that everybody is, you know, kind of adopting. Everyone's sort of building on best practices and learning as they go. Uh, so we're really excited that space and our 
you know, our methodology is to engage really closely with the folks that are doing virtual production and build things and releasing them incrementally as we go. So Genio is a great example of something that we built while we were learning and listening to uh, uh, some, of these, uh, some of these folks in virtual production settings. Uh, we think that's going to continue to evolve. And we have uh, bigger plans uh, in the works that uh, you can expect to hear more of uh, in the future. Um, you know, we really see this as a, a long-term, uh, you know, commitment because it's a trend that we think is, you know, it's not a trend. It's really uh, a new tool in everybody's, uh, you know, in everybody's toolbox. And, uh, you know, we're really keen to support that, fill in gaps, uh, build new capability, and just make it really uh, a lot easier to bridge uh, all of the gaps in the, in the process and uh, get the workflow uh, uh, as efficient and uh, as scalable as possible. Uh, so Dan, I don't know if you have anything to add on top of that. Oh, that's perfect. That's it. Cool. Awesome. All right, another one for Juan since he came back. I'm going to give this one to Juan. Uh, yeah, so they did some tricks. That's, I'm really happy that they help. Um, there is a lot of stuff on Nick Studio on those videos, and I've been working on a whole course. It's just that I haven't been able to finish it. Hopefully, we'll get it out um, uh, soon. So yeah, uh, there is also the, the beginner's course that we released done by DJ, which are great. Um, so yeah, definitely doing more of those. Definitely. And, and, you know, I keep talking with that LinkedIn group, but that's going to be allow us to also share external resources with the education community. So please join if you're interested. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to mention, since I got kicked out in the Spanish one. Yes. See, we can do this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we can do this. Brilliant. Yes. And that goes actually for if there's anyone on the on this link who wants to do presentations, um, we are more than happy to uh, to consider it. So send us an email. I'm going to take this one. What about the new trainer program with FX PhD? So our, we do know that our training program with FX PhD is dated. Um, we've been in, in conversations with them. Um, it's it hasn't been as sustainable with the different versions and the different global requirements for certification. So we currently don't have a certified instructor program. We're still doing some research um, and likely we'll be sending out some polls or some questions to our customers on interest level. Um, putting together these programs is a ton of resources and work and that's fine, but we wanna make sure that it's the right resources and the right work and not just creating something um, that's a series of check boxes. So um, it's still a work in progress. We haven't forgotten about it. We're just trying to figure out what the right path is for us uh, moving forward. So stay tuned is what I can say. Okay, we have, I'm gonna see if we have any other big ones. Most are answered. Question. One here from Tatiana. Uh, how much time does you do a roto or other task in Copycat versus normal process? I suppose it depends on how fast you roto. Um, but I think the, um, <laughs> it, it, it all depends. It's, it's down to the complexity of the shot. Um, we've seen some copycat tasks. If you've got a, like a locked off camera with only one person moving with a, you know, a, a flat background, you can get a very good results very quickly with like within a minute. Um, but if it's something complex, like moving camera, lots of motion blur, uh, moving subjects, you know, it could take hours or, or, or days. So it's, it's there is a sort of a, a balance to it. Um, and I, again, I do want to stress as well that copycat, um, it, it still requires you to be a good artist. So ultimately, like, you know, it, it does come down to kind of the amount of time that you're willing to put in to get those keyframes. Uh, so I, I think it's, yeah, I, I think it all depends on like kind of the, the level of quality and, the, and the, the complexity of the task. So, not an easy answer, unfortunately. But I would just I would suggest that you you you, you give it a whirl and let us know uh, how you get on. I see you answering a question. Do you want to answer that one live? On the difference between Unreal and Katana. Uh, uh, yes, I can answer that live. I'll, uh, I'll see what I say. So that's, uh, it's a great question around uh, Unreal Engine uh, versus Katana for look development. Um, so you know, Katana is really the way to go for production level uh, look dev and lighting. Uh, it's really designed uh, for 
um, pipelines. Uh, it's really designed to empower uh, you know, production teams. And it's also designed to take advantage of, uh, of uh, rendering technology that gives you kind of really final pixel, high quality output. Um, uh, you're doing look dev and lighting in, in real engine is great. Uh, it's great for a previs or uh, certain types of work where you know you're driving things in real time. You know we see a lot of folks using Unreal Engine for LED screens. That's a great use case. Uh, whereas you know Katana is really great for asset prep and you know when you're building your assets in your uh, virtual art department and you're trying to get those assets to look as great as possible. You know, Katana can be a great answer there. And of course, for everything in post, uh, Katana is a, a great, you know, great tool uh, to do uh, lighting work before it gets brought into Nuke. Um, so that's kind of the answer there. There are really, you know, two different uh, things. You know, Unreal is really designed to get uh, real-time output, uh, but it's not really designed to scale across, you know, a pipeline uh, with look, look dev and lighting as kind of a uh, a function that needs to scale it across multiple people and multiple departments. Cool. Well, with that, I think we're done. We got most of the questions done. Um, you know, I'm going to throw one more out there just because I want to be able to say we answered all the questions in our education summit. <laughs> 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 but this is our last question, so <laughs> thank you. Well, then, so this is a really nice one. Um, so, you, like, if, if you haven't seen any of other um, Foundry Live sessions, USD features highly in nearly all of them. Um, like, USD is it's it's the way to go. Uh, it is the I think Mac coined the phrase of like it is the lingua franca of VFX and animation, and um, I think we genuinely believe that. The challenge is that like the way USD kind of transports between apps is not or the kind of best practices for how you use USD in, in the pipeline or how to make it consistent between apps is challenging. So. We absolutely do. Would love to see a bridge that takes can take USD from uh, from any app and bring it into Nuke. Uh, and I think with the the USD tools being worked on in Nuke, there's there's, there's an app, there's a way that we can start bringing USD into into Nuke. Um, similarly, then having a like there is I think some, like some support for your USD in Unreal Editor. So that means that in theory, if you had a bridge like something like Nvidia's Omniverse, you could move data very neatly between various packages live. Um, but even without the live element, um, if everything just spoke USD, then yeah, you, we could have a, a neat pipeline that delivers uh, data all the way th through all packages. Now, between Nuke and Genio, that's a, that's a different thing. At the moment, we're just sending image data, like kind of pixels and like kind of layers. We could send, or and uh, camera data. Um, we could send additional data like USD data, um, but at the moment it's quite challenging to send uh, to capture um, kind of geometry and 3D information out of uh, Unreal. It's not impossible, but um, it's it, it's not it's not currently on our on our roadmap. We we think that's probably better facilitated facilitated by a um, by just kind of better support in both Unreal and Nuke for for USD. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you for, I know it's 9.10 in Dublin. I can see that on your clock. <laughs> also 9.10 in London and it's 5.15 here in uh, Montreal. So thank you everyone for attending. Those of you who stayed up late, those of you who got up early, um, we just hope you understand Foundry is very, very committed to you as educators. Um, and that's why we're all here and uh, there'll be more events um, for, for, your, for your needs. And we look forward to exploring more um, with Nuke 13 and beyond um, in 2021. So stay safe wherever you are. Um, thank you for your time, and we look forward to connecting with you soon. Oh, good call. Thank you, Stefan, who is a member of our Katana team. Stefan has been on every single webinar we've hosted since March 31st last year, which is a total of 81, by the way. And Stefan's always here with tech support, and um, it's just wonderful to have him here. He's like, when he's not here, I, I worry until I see him. So thank you, Stefan, for your time as well. Elise and Kaylin backstage, um, and everyone who's dead at Eugenie, who's dedicated to uh, to our education programs. Um, have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks.